Happy Sunday morning, friends, and happy Memorial Day weekend. We're so glad to be able to worship together, even if it's online. My name is Emily Langan, and I'm a member here at Faith Covenant Church. I'm glad you're joining us. Today, we're continuing a new sermon series called, Who is Jesus Now? How the Ascended Christ Impacts Your Life Today. Pastor Nate is going to teach on how Jesus is our victorious King this morning. But before the service gets started, a couple of things. One, if you're watching on Facebook, will you share this video? We want to be able to get the word out to any friends and family who might need to watch this morning, and we want to make it as accessible as possible. Second, I want to ask a question to get you thinking this morning. What's brought you joy this week? At least for me, I find the news pretty somber with COVID-19, and life is pretty isolating, so I have to look for places of joy. I'm a cyclist, so any time on my bike brings me joy. That and I live with two cats. They're my sources of joy. What about you? What brought you joy this week? Would you take a minute during the countdown clock and share this video and tell us your answers in the comments below? What brought you joy? We'll see you in a few minutes.
Well, good morning, and welcome to Faith Covenant Church Online. My name is Nate Hickox, and I'm the pastor here at Faith Covenant, and I want to welcome you to worship this morning in the name of Jesus. He is alive, He is Lord, and we are here to worship Him this morning. And today we're continuing our sermon series, Who is Jesus Now? How the Ascended Christ Impacts Your Life Today. And today we're talking about the wonderful truth that Jesus is our victorious King. And to kind of start us off and get us in that mindset of worshiping Jesus as King, uh, would you please join me in this call to worship on the screen? If at home or from wherever you're, wherever you're watching, would you please uh, out loud say the words that are underlined and kind of bolded, and I'll say the words that are not. All right, this is from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. O oh Lord Jesus, we do proclaim this morning that you are the King of glory. And Lord, we open up the doors of our heart to let you in. And we open up our lives and we, we open up this time and space in our lives to glorify you, to worship your holy name. Come and minister to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. May we leave this time transformed and changed by your presence. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So glad that you can worship with us today. Let's sing together, Jesus, Son of God. You came down from heaven's throne. This earth you formed was not your home a love like this the world had never known a crown of thorns to mock your name forgiveness fell upon your face a love like this the world had never known. On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God, you laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice. Jesus, Son of God, you took our sin, you bore our shame, you rose to life, you defeated the grave, a love like this, the world has never known. Let's try to sing this out together. Because you took our sin, you bore our shame, you rose to life, you defeated the grave. A love like this, the world had never known. On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name. Son of God, you laid down your perfect life, you are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God, you are Jesus, Son of God, be lifted higher than all you've overcome, your name be louder than any other song there is no power that can come against your love the cross was enough the cross was enough 
The cross was enough. The cross was enough. On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God, you laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice. Jesus, Son of God, on the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God, you laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice. Jesus, Son of God, you are Jesus, Son of God. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who wore our sin and shame now robed in majesty the radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king the fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace the final breath upon the cross is now alive in me your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory all praise will rise to Christ our King. By a spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me and by a spirit i will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me The tomb where soldiers watched in vain Was borrowed for three days His body there would not remain Our God has robbed the grave Sing this loud together Our God has robbed the grave Our God has robbed the grave your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise 
to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Father God, we give you thanks that in you we have victory. No matter what we're going through, no matter if this is a time in our life when things might be a little easier for some reason, we just give you thanks that you're a God who is faithful, who is true, who always, always is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning will be read by Sharon Drucker. But first, let's sing thy word together. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Our scripture from today is from Acts chapter 2, verses 32 through 41. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, our Lord, will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The word of the Lord. Our ministry to children today will be given to us by Eliana Tuggy. Let's sing together, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Come, my people, I'll protect you. No! no! Phew! Wow. Those people sure were lucky to have a king who was so brave and could fight for them. He must have really loved them. Does that sound familiar, kiddos? A king who really loves his people? Well, it should, because that king was like Jesus is for us. We've been learning a lot about Jesus recently, haven't we, boys and girls? We've heard that Jesus is our shepherd, and he's a crafter shaping our hearts, and that he's the head of the church, who's the body. Well, today we're learning about Jesus being a victorious king. He went into a kind of fight with Satan when he died. But you know what? Jesus won. He defeated Satan and was able to come back to life and rise up to heaven. The Bible says Jesus sits at the right hand of God in heaven. This means he's king over everything and he's made it safe for us too. He did all that so we can have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and go to heaven too when we die. Wow. We're pretty lucky to have such a cool king, aren't we, boys and girls? Okay, I'm going to pray for us now. 
Dear Jesus, thank you for coming down to earth just because you love us so much. Thank you for fighting Satan and for us and for being victorious so we can follow you into heaven. We love you very much, Jesus. Please help us not to forget everything you did for us and help us to remember to thank you. Amen. Well, thank you, Eliana, for that wonderful children's sermon. We lo always love hearing the children's sermon every week. We're so grateful for that. And uh, would you please join me in prayer uh, before I begin this morning's sermon? God, we thank you for the privilege of your holy word. And Lord, it's our desire to hear a word from you this morning. Open up our hearts, our minds, and our ears to hear what it is you have to say to us. Speak, O Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. So my three-year-old daughter, Daisy, has been learning a lot about kings and queens and princes and princesses lately. Uh, she has a few cartoons that kind of feature those, uh, those things, you know, kings and queens and such. And uh, I always love pretending that I get to be the king and she's my princess and the king gets to dance with the princess and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but it's kind of funny, right? I mean, uh, there really aren't kings and queens really around our world much anymore. They're not really common today as they were in times past. And in fact, if you want to see any really kings and queens uh, in our world, you have to go to a place called Medieval Times. In fact, one of our uh, church members, Dane Austin, was the king at Medieval Times. And essentially, it's a, it's a show, it's an experience where there's knights and there's a battle and there's a king and a queen and uh, it just brings you back into those times. And, uh, but we fast forward to today into modern times and most people have never lived under a king or queen. Uh, except for at least uh, England, right? England has a queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, but really, she has no authoritative power, right? Like the, the Constitution you know, limits that, and really the, par the Parliament uh, are, is the, are the ones who are making the uh, legal decisions for the country. Uh, so the queen is only a symbolic figure, a symbolic role in England. And perhaps unintentionally, I think this is how many Christians view Jesus' kingship. The idea that Jesus is king and Lord. Uh, you know, they view it as a symbolic power. You know, they, it kind of seems like, you know, real authority and real power seems to lie with the government or the military or the economy, the almighty dollar. Uh, that's how things get done in our world. Uh, so people say. And so what ends up happening is we treat Jesus as kind of a symbolic king. You know, yeah, he's king, but... He's not really in charge. Well, friends, today is Ascension Sunday. Uh, this past Thursday was uh, the Ascension Day. Uh, it's the 40 days after Easter where Jesus ascended to heaven. And we've been in this series called Who is Jesus Now? How the Ascended Christ Impacts Your Life Today. And a big reason that I began this series at our church is because I believe the church needs a fundamental recommitment to the doctrine, to the belief that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. He is our victorious King. He's really in charge around here. Um, and this is how all of the early church, the apostles, uh, they, this is how they understood the meaning of Jesus' ascension into heaven. Uh, I like what uh, Garrett Dawson says about this. He says, The ascended Jesus is the reigning Jesus. Of all the meanings of the ascension, this one is preeminent. Jesus has gone up to the right hand of God the Father, exalted above every name and power. He reigns. Jesus is Lord. There is no other. That's what the ascension means. And so today we're talking about how Jesus is our victorious king. And at home, I'd like to invite you to open up your Bible. I think it, you know, it's important to follow along in the scriptures for yourself. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 32 through 41. Uh, that's going to be the passage I'm preaching on this morning. Now, Kind of what happened just before this is Jesus had ascended to heaven, to the spiritual dimension of heaven, and then Pentecost happens where the ascended Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit upon the church. That's for ne next week. Uh, next week is Pentecost. But what happens is it causes a commotion. People are hearing uh, the apostles speak uh, in their own language and all these kinds of languages, and they're wondering, are these people drunk? What is going on? And so Peter gets up to explain and he preaches the church's first ever sermon. And that's what we're, lo we're looking at, a portion of that sermon uh, in our text this morning. It begins in verse 32 where it says, 
God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Friends, this morning from this passage, I want to communicate to you three points about what it means for Jesus to be our victorious King. And number one is this. Jesus' ascension is His kingly installation, which opened the gates of heaven to all. Jesus' ascension, it's His kingly installation, which opened the gates of heaven to all. Now, let me recap here. Peter has says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and they were witnesses of it. They saw it. Remember from a, back a few weeks ago where we talked about the, the period of 40 days after Easter where Jesus was appearing to people, eating with them, instructing them, and one of the main things he did was convince these very monotheistic Jews that he really was risen from the dead, and he really was who he said he was. That's what, one of the things he did after Easter. But the Father was not finished at Easter. God raised him from the dead, but then God does something else 40 days later. What does it say in verse 33? It says, Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. Now, exalted is kind of another word for ascended, uh, except it's, now it's the Father exalting, ascending Jesus to the right hand of God. Now, this right hand, this is the traditional place of authority and power. Uh, and so that means that the Father has placed the Son next to Him on the throne in a place of real power and real authority. And we see this uh, throughout other New Testament scriptures that I would just to highlight two to you. Many of you are familiar with Philippians chapter 2, very famous hymn about Christ. And it says, Jesus being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Let me show you one more from Ephesians. 120 says this, The Father, he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Heaven being the place of authority where God rules and reigns. And so the Father has, has exalted the Son and ascended him into heaven so that he can reign at the right hand. So really the ascension is Jesus' installation as king. It's his, his enthronement as the king of the world, the king of the universe. Now, if you say that, you know, queen or queen so-and-so has ascended to the throne, Queen Elizabeth has ascended to the throne, um, you, understand it to, you understand it to mean not that they're saying, oh, well, they've, maybe they've, you know, climbed some stairs in some sense and they've actually sat on a literal throne. Most of us don't take it that way. When we say someone has ascended to the throne, what we mean is they've assumed a position of authority. They've been installed into a new office. They have taken a new position which gives them authority in their domain. In the same way, Jesus ascending to heaven means he's ascended to the throne of heaven as king. He's installed as king. And Peter, he wanted to show that his very Jewish audience that this is exactly what God had intended for the Messiah from the beginning. And so he quotes, very appropriately, uh, from the Old Testament, and he quotes from Psalm 100, 110. Now, here's a little bit of Bible triv trivia for you. Did you know that Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament passage that's quoted in the New Testament? It's quoted more times than any other Old Testament passage. So it was crucial for the early church's understanding of what it meant for who Jesus was. And so uh, Peter quotes it. Oh, I guess I don't have it on the screen, so I need, I need to come back. But you have it in your Bible. Psalm 110 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, many scholars believe that in the, the original use of Psalm 110, was used as a way of installing the king in Israel. And installing the king was a glorious ritual. And it involved a procession up to the temple, and it was a, it was a, a huge celebration. And uh, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he recognizes that the ascension is the moment that Jesus is installed as king. 
And so the early church fathers, when they were reflecting on this, they recognized that Jesus' installation was a glorious process and celebration. They saw it as not just a one moment in time, but as a, as a victory procession up to the throne of heaven. You see, ascending to heaven was a victory march over Satan and sin and death. You know, Jesus left heaven to come to earth, but he returns as a victorious winner with a rescued humanity upon his shoulders. You see, we've been talking about the last dance also, and when the Bulls won all those championships, there were uh, championship parades and celebrations in downtown Chicago, right? Uh, in fact, many of our own members, uh, Jace, Jason and Cherish Goldman, Garrett Gutowski, Emily Langan, they were at those celebrations, so you can ask them what it was like to be there. Uh, but everyone is, is celebrating and shouting and cheering, and they're making signs, and they're celebrating the victory that they had witnessed their team accomplish. And this is how the early church fathers envisioned Jesus' ascension. It's a, vic a victory parade into glory. And as he's ascending, we can envision angels that are celebrating and bowing down and rejoicing at the victory of the Son. And then, and this is one of the most magnificent pieces of all, when, when Jesus reaches, metaphorically speaking, the gates of heaven, many of the early church fathers believed that Psalm 24 applied to this situation uh, and that prophesied about the Messiah. And so it says, they picture those in heaven saying, Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So some of the early church fathers, they envisioned Jesus ascending to heaven, reaching the gates, and, and, and the angels cry out, Who is this King of glory? Open up these doors that this King of glory may come in. And so Jesus is as reaches the gates of heaven and the doors open. They open. And they open from that point on for all humanity to enter in, to go where Jesus has gone. How does that impact your life today? Friends, Jesus has paved the way to heaven for us. By his ascension, heaven's gates have been opened. I like how one of the other church, church, early church fathers said this. Tertullian says, the way of ascent, or the way, the way to heaven, was thereafter leveled with the ground by the footsteps of the Lord, and an entrance thereafter opened by the might of Christ. That's what happened when Jesus ascended into heaven. He opened the gates for all. So his ascension, we need to view it as this victory parade. All of heaven is rejoicing at the triumph of the Son. The angels praise his name and he opens the gates of heaven and he's installed as the glorious king of the world. Wow, what a king we serve. What a king we serve. So that's number one. Jesus' ascension is his kingly installation where the gates of heaven are open for all. Number two. Jesus' ascension means he is king of the world right now. He is king of the world right now. You see, we said he was installed, he was enthroned. Um, in the early church, their earliest confession of faith was simply, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. And that means Caesar is not. All other political parties and, and people that are, are vying for power in this world, they are not really in charge. Jesus Christ is. He's in charge. And I like what Karl Barth points out in the Apostles' Creed that when Jesus is sitting at the right hand, it's the only present tense verb that we get about Jesus in the Apostles' Creed. I want you to notice this for yourself. We proclaim this uh, usually on Communion Sundays together. And we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived, past tense, by the, by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and look how it changes. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. That is a present reality of what we believe. He is there. And then it goes on to say, a future tense, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And actually, that'll be for our next sermon series after we finish this one. We'll be talking about that. 
Uh, but right now, he is seated at the right hand right now, the place of authority. That's what Jesus is up to. That's what he's doing. He's ruling the world presently from the throne in heaven. And you might already be asking, can this really be true? I mean, look at all the evil and the injustice, the pain and the sickness and the, and the violence in our world. It's, it's so broken. Um, if Jesus is king, it's kind of hard to believe it, or, or maybe he's even making a mess of the place. Uh, what's going on? You see, the church believes that Jesus is ruling of the world, is absolutely real. He's king and lord of the world right now. But the way, the way he rules is different than all other ways that human rulers rule. It's absolutely different. It is upside down. And Psalm 110, again, that most quoted passage of the Old Testament, helps us understand this. So let's go back to it. So the Lord said to my Lord, uh, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And it says, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of of your enemies. Notice that. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Notice the king who is in charge, who is at the right hand, has enemies. The king has enemies. See, there are forces in this world that are in opposition to Jesus, and they are real, and they are present even while he sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is ruling in the midst of forces that are against all the good and loving goals that he has for the world. And Jesus is ruling in the midst of them, in the midst of evil, in the midst of Satan's power and demons, in the midst of the cultural evil of our world, in the midst of all of its brokenness, Jesus is ruling. So you might want to ask, well, how is Jesus going to rule and overcome these forces that destroy our world? What's he going to do? Actually, can we go back to the Psalm 100, 110 passage where it says, the Lord is going to extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Now, Zion, that's another term for Jerusalem or the Temple Mount. And it's the, basically, this is the same thing in another way that Jesus said to his disciples right before he ascended. He said, you will be my witnesses from where? Jerusalem, that's Zion, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. And really, the early church took this phrase to mean that the, that the king's rule, that Jesus' rule is going to extend over the world as the gospel is preached and as people begin to put their trust in the name of Jesus. So this is how Jesus said his kingdom would grow, right? He said it would grow like yeast working through dough, like a mustard seed, mustard seed pl uh, that's planted and begins to grow slowly into a plant, a large, large plant. Uh, you see, Jesus' rule, it's so different because it's so loving and it's so patient with all people. People that you, you and I don't think that we should be patient with, Jesus is patient with. Jesus' rule, it's, a, it's kind of like a father forgive them, they know not what they're doing type of rule. Uh, and he wants everybody, no matter what they've done, how evil they might be, that, or we think they might be, he wants them all to come to repentance and bit by bit, the gospel is spreading and the Lord's rule is expanding. And sometimes it feels like, if we're honest, that we can't really see it. That we can't really see that he's working. Uh, but I think many of you have probably heard the new popular song. It's called Way Waymaker. It's got some powerful lyrics in it. And it says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You see, we walk by faith, not by sight. We believe that Jesus died for us and he rose again by faith. And we believe that he's king and lord of the world by faith as well. And friends, when we really believe this, when we meditate on this, this is going to fill us with so much hope. You see, Jesus is lord right now. He's lord today. He was lord yesterday. He's lord today. He's going to be lord tomorrow unless he comes again. Uh, but as our lord and king, he is committed to caring for his people. And we touched on this last week as we talked about Jesus being the head of the church. But I want you to know that your king is looking out for you no matter what comes, no matter what the forces of evil do in this world, your king is caring for you. And I love how John Calvin puts this. Um, 
And again, it's a, it's a little bit of a longer quote, but it's so good, it's so rich. It's poetic language. He says, Thus it is that we may patiently pass through this life with its misery, its hunger, cold, contempt, reproaches, and all other troubles, content with this one thing, that our King will never leave us destitute, but will provide for our needs until our warfare ended, we are called to triumph. Such is the nature of His rule. Remember, it's different. That He shares with us all that He has received from the Father. And now He arms and equips us with His power, adorns us with His beauty and a magnificence, and He enriches us with His wealth. That's what your king does for you. He provides for us. He fills us. Friends, because Jesus is king, you have nothing to fear. Because Jesus is king, nothing can ultimately harm you. Because Jesus is king, you will have all you need. And because Jesus is king, no matter what happens with the politics of this world, they don't have your allegiance and they don't cause you to worry. Because you know who is on the throne. And because Jesus is king, you will get through this. You will make it. And we, you will, we will make it to the other side, not only of the season that we're in, but also through all the trials of life. And our Father and King will welcome us home. And so this is our hope that he is our king. And he's ruling the world right now. That's number two. Jesus' ascension means he is king of the world right now. And that brings me to number three. Jesus' ascension means that we have a decision to make about the king. We have a decision to make about this king, a real decision with our lives. Uh, you know, Peter, he's in the sermon, he's speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience, and he has told them that basically they are responsible for putting Jesus to death. They put Jesus to death. But God raised him up and exalted him to the right hand, and now he's poured out this, the Holy Spirit as they're now seeing and then he says to them, he has made the one that you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And in verse 37, it says this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. And it goes on to say more. You see, they were cut to the heart and they ask, what shall we do? That is the most important question you could ever ask with your life. What will you do about Jesus Christ? How will you respond to Jesus Christ? What will you do with him? Friends, this is the most important you could ask both now and forever. And Peter says simply, repent and be baptized, every one of you. So he says, repent, that means to turn around 180 degrees. You were going this way, living your own life, and then you went this way, to, and when we turned around and, I, and you said, I'm going with Jesus, that's repentance. Then he says, be baptized. Now, this is, this is the initiation right into the community of Jesus, into the kingdom. And Craig Keener, a biblical scholar, gives us some helpful uh, pointers here about what this meant for this audience. And Keener says, because baptism was a sign of conversion to Judaism, normally reserved for pagans, Peter's demand would offend his Jewish hearers and cost them respectability. He calls for a public, radical testimony of conversion, not a private, non-committal request for salvation with just no conditions. No, repent and be baptized. Make a public declaration that you are converting your whole life to Jesus Christ. He will now be your king from now on. But I want to make clear to you that it's not the baptism that saves it's the fact that Peter says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, the person being baptized would confess their faith and their trust in Jesus as their Lord, their King, and their Savior. And now because of that, they receive the free gifts of forgiveness of all their sins and also God's very Holy Spirit dwelling within them. It's an amazing promise and Peter says this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This promise of forgiveness in the Spirit is for you. It is for you. It is for everybody. The whole world is invited in. And if you happen to be watching this service, uh, maybe you've been curious about Jesus Christ yourself. 
Uh, may, maybe you've, got, you've, you've gone to church, but you haven't been connected in a while. Um, you've, but you've never really actually committed yourself to following Jesus before. And friends, I want to urge you that there is only one way out of this life, and it's death. And after we die, we will face the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand before God and be judged by the things we've done in this world, both good and bad. And none of us are good enough to stand before a holy God. We will be judged. But Jesus Christ, he has opened the gates of heaven. He has opened the way to eternal life. He, because of what he did for you on the cross, he has paid and forgiven for all your sins. And now he asks you to repent of your sin, to put your faith and trust in him, and Peter adds, to be baptized, to come into the community of the church. That's what we have to do. So friends, I urge you right now, whatever you need to do, get right with God and submit your life to him as king. And if you've never done that, at the end of the sermon, you'll have an opportunity to pray with me and we'll, make that, we'll pray that, to, that together. But I think for many of us who are watching this sermon right now, we have received Jesus as our King. He is our Lord. And what we need to do is to recover the urgency of this message. The urgency that Jesus is really King right now and He's coming again. And this is what Peter does. Look what Peter does. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. A glorious day. Do you ever notice this? This is, this is just for free. Jesus said to Peter, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Peter just got the largest catch of his life. Through the power of the Spirit, 3,000 people are added because he pleaded, pleaded with them. He warned them. He preached the gospel to them. And I want you to ask yourself, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, would you ever plead with somebody to accept Jesus as Lord? Would you ever warn somebody that they need to accept Jesus as Lord? You know, certainly we don't want to be impatient or pushy or, or rude. We want to be loving and gentle and respectful of all people. But ask yourself, would you sincerely plead with somebody, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, to put their trust in Jesus Christ? And if you're not sure that you would, or if you never really have before, then I believe that we are not grasping the, the magnitude of who Jesus is and what it is we say that we believe. We believe he's risen and we believe he's ascended to the throne. He's the king. We have good news to share. And it's an urgent and powerful and a, the most important message anybody could hear. He's now Lord. He's the one way of salvation. And without that salvation, all that we can expect is a terrifying judgment. Nothing could be more urgent. And friends, I know that I need more urgency in my life. It's something we need to pray for. That the Spirit, the early church often prayed, God, fill us with boldness to proclaim your message. So right now, Jesus is King of heaven and earth. He has opened the way to heaven for all. And we must all make the most important decision of our lives. What are we going to do about Jesus Christ? And no matter where you are in your faith journey, whether you are someone wanting to trust Jesus for the first time or you're a longtime believer, I invite you to pray this prayer together of submitting our lives to King Jesus. We all can do this. And so if you're at home, you can repeat after me. Friends, this is the most important thing that you could do. Let's pray this prayer together. You can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are Lord and King. I put my whole trust in you. I repent of all my sin. I give my life over to you. Grant me your Holy Spirit to help me follow you. Thank you for saving me. Give me boldness. Give me urgency to share Jesus with others. God, thank you that we even have the grace and the gift to submit our lives to you as king. We do proclaim that you are, you are our king, you are our Lord, and we are now your ambassadors to go share the message of the king, the good news that he is Lord, he is king, and he has provided a way of salvation for all people. So Lord, make us urgent and give us boldness in proclaiming this message, even in a season such as this. 
Give us opportunities, Lord, we pray, to share the good news with all that we may have contact with. And now together, let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for us to remember God through our tithes and our offerings and to give him thanks for all the things he has done for us and will continue to do for us. Let's sing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's respond to the service together by singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. Inhale him as thy matchless king through all the eternity. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing who died and rose on high who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die crown him the lord of love behold his hands and side rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight but downward bends each burning eye at mystery so bright crown him the lord of years the potentate of time Creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for Thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Well, friends, thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Would you all do us a favor? Uh, we would love to know if you joined us for worship today. Uh, please fill out, fill out our digital connect card. You can find that at faithecc.org. Um, or if you're watching on Facebook, it should be right above the post. You can click on it and fill it out that way. Um, just let us know that you were here and uh, share any prayer requests you might have with us. We would love to pray for you. Uh, a few announcements before we close this morning. Uh, next Sunday, it's another church holy day. It's Pentecost where we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church. Uh, the, we'll have a worship gathering at, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, please check the Life at Faith newsletter. Make sure that you either download or print off the lyrics beforehand. And uh, remember to park every other space, and uh, we will see you for that worship night. Uh, I also want to let you know that uh, myself and the church board, the leadership, we are hard at work looking at all the regulations from the state, from the Central Conference of the Evangelical Covenant Church, um, and I personally have been following 
closely all the different recommendations that are coming in, all the different things that churches are, to, are doing uh, as they prepare for uh, reopening at some point. Um, we don't have any information to share today, uh, uh, but I do, uh, as soon as we know, as soon as we have a plan put together, you can be sure that we will let you know, and we are working on it. Um, I also want to let you know that we're still moving forward with our construction on our building. Uh, we, we believe God provided uh, miraculously for that, and we, uh, and we are planning to continue that. Um, and, but first and foremost, the, I want to let you know uh, that we're going to be getting new technology installed, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we're going we're to be getting permanent and high-quality video recording equipment uh, so that we can both record and live stream services going forward. Uh, this will be of great help uh, so that when we do start gathering again, um, our service will be available uh, digitally to those who uh, aren't able to join us or they're too vulnerable to join. Um, when we do regather, we'll have the technology to be able to have a high quality uh, live stream and recording. Um, so we're excited to include that as part of our uh, initial construction phase when we do get started. Um, also, we will be having our annual meeting uh, virtually this year uh, that will take place on Sunday, June 14th at 4 p.m. Uh, details are going to be available in the Life at Faith newsletter about how you can access uh, that meeting. Uh, just, I invite you to keep praying for me and for the church leadership uh, as we navigate these difficult and unusual times. We need your prayers. We need the Lord's wisdom. So please pray for me and pray for us. Uh, after service, I again want to invite you to join us for our virtual church lobby on Zoom. Uh, that'll start after the five-minute countdown. So go grab a cup of coffee, go do what you need to do, come back, and we'll uh, be together in the church lobby. Now, brothers and sisters, receive the benediction. May the love of our Heavenly Father draw you ever closer to Him. May the grace and peace of Jesus Christ guide you on the journey, and may the power of the Holy Spirit send you now to go be the church and make disciples. Amen. Have a great week.